We're putting FPGAs in our ISA slots. More about this and other stories on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Castle Quest Lost and Found. PC fans get a graphics gremlin. Play multiplayer console games online with Pie Packer. And is VR the future of retro? All this and our community question of the week on This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. Neil, do you have any stories of the one that got away in gaming? Uh, I'm talking about a game you played when you were younger that you have distinct memories of but you've completely lost track of in the meantime? There is, there is. I have managed to regain track of this game, but it bugged me for years. Um, it was a, a game that took me years to track down, and it stuck in my mind because you know how you could fire up Workbench on the Amiga, and there was this Say utility, a Say program. Oh, yeah. And, of course, we'd all use it to make our computer say rude words out loud. Yes. <laughs> well, the entire game used that. Uh, it was a murder mystery game set in an old mansion, and all the characters were, were voiced, so it was like a talkie long before the CD-ROM era gave us the capacity for, for voice dialogue. And uh, yeah, it was a talkie murder mystery. And of course, it sounded like a, sounded like a crazed robot performing a play. <laughs> you know, it was really quite crazy to listen to. Um, and yeah, and I played it and I loved it. And I forgot about it for decades until something triggered a distant memory. These things come along once in a while and they just trigger that that flicker in your memory of an old game and this was one of them and i had to track it down and even with the help of the internet it took me a long time but that game i eventually found and it was called mortville manor it came out in 1987 and uh, if you want to have a giggle go and listen to it. it there are playthroughs of it on youtube and just note that when you're listening to it there are no subtitles in this game it's just that voice all the way through that voice or nothing have you played that one john oh, wow. mortville manor I, I i've not heard of that but i will definitely check it out it sounds yeah, it dude. sounds interesting i'm surprised that more games didn't go that route on the amiga just because of the technology that was just sort of you know built into it with the with the voice samples and things like that but uh but yeah mortville manor you know uh in the pre-internet era well all the way up until the, the 2000s. This happened to me all the time. I would constantly lose track of games and think about them and not be able to find them. You know, I'd play a game at a friend's house or I'd see a title in a rental store and then the friend would move away or the game would just disappear from the shelf. Uh, it was always a big event, you know, when you rediscover a game like that. You feel like part of your childhood has, has been restored. Um, of course, now with the plethora of internet gaming databases out there, whenever I remember a game from my younger days, I can almost always uh, remember enough about it to find you know, the title and, and figure out what it is. But there's definitely still games out there waiting to be rediscovered. And that's the subject of our first story. So uh, subreddit user MoBeast68W shares the story of Arthur Wire. This was a kid who spent much of his youth on the pre-internet online service Genie. Uh, playing a text adventure called Castle Quest. So in Castle Quest, you play the role of a medieval explorer who stumbles upon a mysterious castle, and as you can expect, hijinks ensue. Uh, just like we were talking about before, Arthur remembered playing the game, he remembered the title, but when Genie disappeared into the into the ether at the end of the 90s, uh, all of the games on its servers did too. Uh, probably one of the first casualties of the same kind of fate that befalls modern MMOs to this day. Yeah, and it must have been a hard one to track down because there is a Castle Quest on the NES and on, on mm -hmm. some other platforms, but it's a completely different game. So that would have been a, exactly. a difficult one for him to track down. Um, but yeah, MM MMOs are especially hard to stomach because when the servers go down, you you know, you've put a huge number of hours into these games uh, and you've also amassed virtual wealth, or you should have done if you've been playing it correctly, and also property. <laughs> You formed relationships with other players. Yeah, perhaps a wife or a husband. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, I'm th thinking about World of Warcraft and Ultima and, and Wizardry Online and all of those kinds of games. And um, you don't know if those relationships are going to continue in other games because you've laid the foundations within this game. Does your friendship group in Ultima carry through to Battlefield 1942? I don't know. Would it work? <laughs> I don't know. You know, very different games. So... Um, yeah, it's very difficult when they shut down these servers. And I think game studios, when they decide to pull the plug on them, they should probably pledge to release the source code, at least for the client and host services, so that people can continue their virtual lives. I, I think we almost need ethical MMOs in that respect. Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely, I know that uh, there was a. It was a big deal when City of Heroes uh, was was found last year. Uh, classic MMO from uh, about a decade ago, and uh, it was resurrected on a bunch of private servers. Of course, this was not officially condoned by the company that owns the rights. Everything was leaked, but it, there was still much rejoicing for fans of that game that they could actually play it again. So, uh, now getting back to Castle Quest, there's a happy ending to the story. Um, so Arthur also moonlights as a game preservationist, uh, and he did some digging and it turns out that the version of castle quest that he played on genie was actually a port of a much older game so back in the late 1970s there were two guys mike holtzman and mark kirschenblatt two students at new york's Rieselier polytechnic institute uh, they wrote castle quest as a hobby project in fortran on the university's mainframe computer uh, this sat around on the on on this uh, on this client for years until uh, in the early 90s somebody happened to come across it and they offered to port it to Genie, uh, the source and CompuServe. So you know in the early 90s, uh, around the time, but maybe just a little bit before AOL really took off and became the dominant platform, uh, all of these online services were looking for games to put on their on their services, and they needed something simple, text adventure. So I guess somebody was combing the archives in in this New York University and, and found it. So uh, this guy offered to port it and split the royalties with the game's original programmers, who by this time had moved on with their lives. We're talking about more than a decade after they wrote it. So uh, it was the port of that original game that Arthur ended up playing. Well, anyway, um, the the way that this game, you know, he originally contacted the, the, the authors and they said, well, we don't really think that any of the source code actually survives anymore, but we did submit something to copyright it. It turns out one of the authors, Mike Holtzman, uh, he thought that he just submitted some documentation, but it turns out he actually submitted the original source code to the U.S. Copyright Office way, way back in the day. So under current or under U.S. copyright law, any newly created work is automatically copyright. But his overly due diligence ended up preserving the game because that copy, that copy that he sent to the U.S. Copyright Office is the only copy of the source code that still survives. So... Arthur got in touch with Mike. Like I said, Mike wrote to the copyright office asking for a copy of his submission, and uh, they printed it out, mailed him copies to, to back to Arthur. So, in the course of a week, uh, the source code to Castle Quest went from being shrouded in obscurity for all time to being freely available with the author's permission online on GitHub. Pretty incredible, huh, Neil? Yeah, that that is incredible. I don't know how common it was to actually submit the entire source code for copyright. Right. You know, I can imagine snippets of unique source code might be submitted for a certain function that somebody's come up with but um to, to have submitted the entire source code that's brilliant it, it sounds like in a world of copyright trolling that we live in now it, it feels like copyright is working for both the creator and and the people in equal measure and i really like that yeah <laughs> this was probably the first time it was the first time that that's happened <laughs> it's, it's great so as is common with older machine code actually compiling castle quest from its fortran form into something actually usable by modern machines was an ordeal in itself uh when arthur per first posted it he's like well here's the code i have no idea what to do with it because you know nobody knows fortran anymore if you have <laughs> if you have a grandfather or grandmother that was a programmer back in the day that still understands this stuff. And thanks to the power of the game preservation community, uh, all the hard work has been done, and you can actually play this long-lost uh, text adventure for yourself. If you are still coding in Fortran for a living, I probably couldn't afford your hourly rate anyway to, That's <laughs> to get this thing converted. But um, yeah, looking at the game itself, I haven't played it yet, but it, it looks like the game is set, or it looks like it reads like, because obviously it's a text adventure. It is set in a castle... You have to locate and kill the master of the castle, and it's set in Eastern Europe. So I'm pretty sure you can guess where the story is going with that plot. <laughs> I think there also might be a crucifix on the first um, screen. So. <laughs> there might be some. There might be some pointy teeth involved somewhere along the way. <laughs> there might be. There might be. So um, yeah, I think all we need now, John, is for someone to compile it for the Amiga and have the Amiga narrate the whole game using the Say engine, and we can enjoy that silky smooth synthesized voice for this game. <laughs> That, that's right. All you have to do is add that voiceover narrator, put in some sampled sound effects, and that sweet, sweet Amiga pan flute that's featured on every Amiga sound soundtrack. Oh, yeah. You've got something there. <laughs> so, uh, the, you know, the Amiga really, they need some new text adventures. So, hopefully, that will happen. Uh, and if you'd like to know more about Castle Quest, just click on the link in the show notes. 
And speaking of the Amiga, Amiga Forever is now nine versions old, matured, fermented, however you want to put it. It's a very well put together package for anyone with an interest in the Amiga computer and it's an easy way to enjoy an authentic Amiga experience on modern hardware. Amiga Forever aims to preserve and make accessible in a fully legal and authorised context the Amiga Legacy. Whether you want to dip into an Amiga 1000, CDTV or a fully loaded A4000, Amiga Forever has the pre-configured and ready-to-go experience right there for you across three affordable editions of the package. We'd like to thank AmigaForever.com for supporting the show today. Do yourself a favour and make your life a whole lot easier by checking it out. Our next story, John, is for a new piece of hardware that continues the trend and caters to the demand of allowing us to use original hardware in more convenient ways, or in some cases just to enable us to continue to use that hardware at all. Old CRT monitors supporting a 15 or 18 kilohertz signal even are really diminishing in their availability and those that do exist fetch a premium price. But the more common 31 kilohertz CRTs are still out there and um, fairly easy to get a hold of. They're not, they're not super cheap but you can get them for a fair price and I dare say many of us have friends or relatives with them just sitting in their lofts ready to... Um, to to make space because they do take up room and people are normally happy to just get rid of them so um john you're still you're still using original crts aren't you i think i can see one at least one behind you right now um so how important is that to your experience of retro gaming if if it were up to me i do all of my classic gaming on crts there's there's just something about the warm glow that they admit that that i can't get enough of unfortunately what i can get enough of is their weight they weigh a million pounds oh, yeah. they're next to impossible to box up and take with you on a move without risking damage um I, i've got a 1702 behind me hooked to my amiga 1000 mostly just to annoy all the true amiga fans who are aghast that you'd be able to do anything without rgb but i've also got a, a jvc pvm uh to my left that can do both ntsc and pal and that i run all of my other retro hardware on uh, but of course once you get beyond the composite spectrum you have to deal with all kinds of issues with refresh rate and stuff and i'm guessing that that's what this story is about right neil it is it is and uh, yeah wait i I will never miss the weight of CRTs in (laughs) regular life. I remember once I had a 21-inch CRT. I think that's as large as I got. And I was really proud of this thing. And I took it to a LAN party in the first week of owning it. By the time it came home, it had a huge scratch across the glass on the front of the screen because it just rolled over in the back of the car. Oh, oh, I was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> That's awful. That's yeah. awful. I'll never, I'll never forget moving televisions up flights of stairs in the dormitories at, at university. It was an ordeal. And once it was done, you're like, I'm never moving this thing back down. It's just going to stay in the room forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Throwing flat panel TVs out of hotel room windows just doesn't have the same effect. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Sorry, rock bands of today. <laughs> Well, old school PC fans can rejoice because a new ISA graphics card is here called the Graphics Gremlin, which I already love because here in the UK we had a software publisher called Gremlin Graphics. So just the name puts me in a nostalgic mindset, so I love it already. And what this card does is it uses an FPGA to emulate old video standards, including IBM's MDA, which was its monochrome adapter, and that was uh, uh, unusual by modern standards, 18 kilohertz, Mm -hmm. and CGA, which was their color graphics array, probably more commonly known, and running at 15 kilohertz. Maybe you've got a nice old IBM desktop and um, you want to have a few more graphics options uh, without going to the expense of the original cards. Or, um, you know, perhaps... Perhaps you, you, you've got the PC, but the monitor's broken. And this is the really cool part about this card because it can do these standards, but it can also output them at 31 kilohertz as well as the original range. So you've effectively got a built-in upscaler um, and that will make it compatible with those more common 31 kilohertz CRTs or indeed flat panels. But, you know, if you've got an old IBM, you probably want to keep it CRT. And this just makes it all a bit more affordable, especially compared to the price of um, external upscalers. They're not cheap. Now, I've said this before, John, I am an admirer of what was achieved on MGA and CGA systems in that era. But I wasn't into IBM compatible machines. I wasn't really a fan of them until the VGA era. But that shouldn't put you off this card because I said the built in upscaling was cool, but it gets better. Being FPGA based, the designer says future graphic standards may be added to the card. 
So we could have the ability to switch the cores on the FPGA and it will be an, a VGA card. I'm not mm -hmm. promising that will happen, but it, you know, it's on the notes as something the designer would like to do. And perhaps going a step further, you might be able to choose the make and the model of the graphics card. So you can switch between lots of different classic cards. I'd love to be able to do that. And it will allow you to make your, your old PC into the dream configuration that you always wanted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is really the best of both worlds because what you're essentially doing is taking what the Mister did for classic computers and you're doing it for old school graphics cards. Uh, being able to essentially build a DOS machine that can seamlessly emulate whatever video card you like mm -hmm. just by flipping through cores sounds like a dream come true for fans of the you know classic PC games who are always struggling with refresh rates. It seems like a never ending battle. So it's another example of combining old technology with new upgrades to get the most out of your hardware, but it's also going to awaken those same old arguments about what authentic hardware means when you introduce those kinds of upgrades into the mix. Yep, yeah, the war drums are thumping. I can hear them yeah. already. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do like this idea. Can you imagine if they also did it for SAM cards? So perhaps, you know, you'd have in another slot an FPGA card that could switch between Sound Blaster, AdLib, Ultrasound. It would be really cool to have these options. Um, I really like it. But the question is how deep does this rabbit hole go before you you know before the balance tips um just to try and see the other side of the argument on the other side mm -hmm. of the fence you know when is your old system then technically a brand new system when is the ancient silicon only really being used to put power <laughs> into the right. fpga cards and the fpga cards are doing everything you know again it's a common theme that we've seen on other platforms but this is a new one, I think, on the PC or IBM PC compatibles. Um, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, I think it's okay if you've got the FPGA cards in the ISA and PCI slots, and then the motherboard CPU and the RAM is working as normal because you're effectively putting things into those slots that were intended to go into those slots. Upgrades. Doesn't matter that it's an FPGA upgrade. It, it's a it's a graphics card it's a sound card and if the ram and the cpu and the motherboard are still working as originally intended i'd be pretty happy with that as a balance i think i think that's where my preference sits mm -hmm. um yeah so i think you know wherever you sit it's worth thinking about this because unless you've got the repair skills and the deep pockets to buy original hardware as it becomes more and more expensive um you're going to struggle and i think this yeah. is a good option well, you're going to struggle until eventually that retro bubble is going to burst. It all comes crashing down, Neil. Oh, yes. And then we'll rejoice. <laughs> we can but hope, John. We can but hope, you know. And in a funny way, the way we're being priced out of the market to get this original hardware, that's what's fueling people to come up with things like this. So, um, you know, like, like the graphics gremlin. So supply, demand, price, and alternatives for the rest of us. It's, it, it's, it's a conversation that we'd better get used to in the coming Economics. years. Economics. Who knew it worked for us? Exactly. There's no avoiding it. There really yeah. isn't. But uh, if you'd like to find out more about the graphics gremlin, you can look on GitHub for it. You can use the show notes for links. And I'd love to know your opinion on the, the gathering momentum behind FPGAs and the FPGA hybrid movement for our old systems. What are your thoughts on it? Let us know. Head over to the subreddit where you can leave a comment. And uh, thanks to Control Alt Reese for submitting this particular story. Neil, for many of the revolutionary advancements modern gaming has brought us, one thing it hasn't allowed us to do is get everybody back together on the same couch. Uh, even before the pandemic, as we age, we move away from home and start families, it gets harder and harder to have those all-night gaming sessions where everyone is crowded around a pizza box, a two-liter, and the multiplayer game of the moment, You know whether it's Worms, GoldenEye, or WWF, No Mercy. So Neil, of all of your couch co-op memories, are there any that stand out to you? Just the one pizza box, John. We'd need at least one pizza box each, surely. <laughs> That's true. Surely. That's true. Um, yeah, I mean, we've spoken about this before. I've spoken of my love of GoldenEye and Mario Kart sessions in the past. So uh, I'll go back a little bit further um, and share my memories of Kickoff 2 on the Amiga, which um, you may be thinking, well, you generally had your micro in your bedroom or in a study. Did you have a couch in your bedroom? How could you couch play that? Well, I'll say two words, John. Big telly. <laughs> the, uh, the the highlight of the week of the month or even the year of any micro owning kid was to bring it down into the lounge and plug it into the big telly uh, and for me that was usually christmas or birthdays i got to do that mm. i'd be allowed down 
on the when I say big telly I'm talking about a 21 inch family TV you know that was a big telly at the time none of this right. 50 inch nonsense and uh, me and my brother we would sit on the couch and we would have marathon football matches of kickoff two and later it's follow up goal um, and yeah just just great great memories and I know you were more of a console kid I don't know if you got the same thrill out of that or not was that something you did was big telly a thing for you John Big telly time was all the time, Neil. Uh, <laughs> you know, by the time I got to high school, really even before then, we had a a big TV in our basement. And by big, again, this is something like 24 inches. So still incredibly small compared to the TVs of today. But we had a big TV in our basement. And uh, my friends and I would play epic games of uh, of Mario Party. You know, the first, the first system that I had that we really did a lot of couch co-op was the N64, just because it had those four controller slots in the front of it. I I mean, it was it was a perfect system for multiplayer. So Mario Party, is it a good game? No, it's not a good game by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's random, it's unfair, it's infuriating, but I love it. <laughs> for, for my friends and I, Joey, Dan, Matt, myself, we would gather in my basement and play multiple 50-turn games in a might. Yeah, in a night in between spirited rounds of Star Trek, the collectible card game. You have no idea how popular we were with the ladies in high school, Neil. Just, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I what I wouldn't give to recreate that feeling again. Even though we all live in different parts of the country, so there's a new Kickstarter on the horizon that offers the promise of reuniting your friends through the same classic games you remember playing on your favorite consoles, and it's called Get Ready, the Pie Packer. Um, I'm not. I'm not so sure about that name, Neil. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm just sorry. I'm still picturing Joey, Dan, Matt, and John, the the two cool crew, co-op, a couch play. You know, talking about if, the ladies. If, if 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 you're watching the video version of the show, I guarantee you, Duncan will be flashing some pictures up on the screen. Right <laughs> excellent, <laughs> excellent. I'll look out for them. Um, but yeah, Pi Packer. When you put the word pie into any bit of hardware, the assumption is Raspberry Pi such mm -hmm. is the popularity of it in, in lots of things these days. So is this another Raspberry Pi-based project? Tell me more about it. You know, I thought the exact same thing. I was like, okay, maybe this is just another, you, you stick the Raspberry Pi in the thing and then it does something else. But yeah. that's not what this is at all. Uh, Pi Packer is actually a couple different things. Um, on the base of it, it's a browser-based gaming service that mainly focuses on simultaneous multiplayer games from the NES through the PS1 era. Uh, according to their site, uh, there is no client software required. You play games directly through the browser. So if you're just in the market for getting together with your friends online to play some of your favorite classic console games, this could be a good solution, as the other big player in the market, Anstream, uh, doesn't actually offer online multiplayer titles. So uh, things that are different between Pi Packer and Antstream. One, uh, it's definitely more going to be more console focused. Two, you don't have to download the client to play it. And three, you get the you get the, the couch co-op type games on, on this service. But where Pi Packer really stands out from Antstream and other services is this gizmo called the Pi Reader. So this is the other part of the equation. This is a box with four USB ports on the front of it that you can plug actual classic cartridges into. So the cart reader looks kind of like a Game Genie or an action replay device, and it sits between the cartridge and uh, the slot of a NES, Super Nintendo, or Mega Drive cart, and allows you to play those games in multiplayer mode through the same interface. So imagine, just to, just to paint a, a word picture, you've got a, you've got a box that looks sort of like a flattened out uh, N64, then you have a cartridge adapter that slots into that, and then finally you put the game cartridge itself into the top. So. Theoretically, any multiplayer game you have the cartridge for, you can play online in simultaneous multiplayer mode. It seems pretty incredible. Uh, the one thing that gives me pause is all the talk about being able to drag and drop your own ROMs into the service. They actually talk about ROMs on the Kickstarter page. Uh, it's the sort of talk that makes the lawyers come out of the woodwork, if you know what I'm saying. What do you, what do you think, Neil? The cartridge bit is quite interesting because it makes me wonder, is it ripping that cartridge? Is mm -hmm. it just reading that cartridge and saying, okay, I know what this is, so therefore you legally own it, therefore we'll just stream it online for right. you? In which case, can you use one of the SD card cartridges to fool it into mm. thinking you own things? I, I yeah, don't know. like an EverDrive or something like that. 
clearly their model in that case isn't to make money from the ROMs themselves. It's just to say you can play whatever you want, which is a fairly interesting model, but then they, they wouldn't have the rights to sell them anyway. That's quite a complex beast to tackle. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, interesting to see how this plays out. But looking at the Kickstarter page in the video, and I don't know if this was um, a prototype mock-up video or this is actually how it works, but they were playing worms in the sample video and down one side of the screen they had four faces, four webcams all playing along and, and laughing and playing and looking like they were having the time of their life. <laughs> and um, I really like that. I really like that because it adds that feeling of playing together, being able to see the frustration and the excitement on someone's face, uh, to see them really, really leaning in and trying to beat you or catch up with you in the game. That was a big part of the couch experience, reading body language. That's a huge part of the whole experience. So right. I like that, and I'd like to give it a go for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're not the only one, Neil. Uh, the Pie Packer Kickstarter continues to be funded as we speak. Uh, it blazed past its original $70,000 goal. It's currently at around 144000 bucks. So they've, they've blown past, they've doubled their original goal, and there are new stretch goals being added all the time. Uh, as far as the pricing goes, you can currently pledge uh, 40 bucks, sort of at the lowest level for a six-month pass to the service alone, or 180 bucks gives you a lifetime membership to the service plus the Pi Reader and the three-card adapter. So it'll be really interesting to see all, how all this turns out. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how front ends and emulators respond to these services if they become popular. It's not a new thing trying to shoehorn multiplayer over the internet into emulators. Going as far back as things like um, a SNES 9X, that has an online component right. built in. I've never had a great experience with it. No, but then never. I, but then I haven't tried it for a long time. I was trying it on mm-hmm. slow connections, so maybe maybe that works better now. I don't know. So it'll be interesting to see how these things uh, respond and um, uh, how the people respond. People will be willing to pay for convenience. They always have been. Uh, and and if $40 for six months brings that convenience and makes it pick up and play on a console in front of your telly, I'm all in. I like I like that idea. We'll see, we'll see if the demand materializes and, and how it goes. Yeah, I think that it all depends on the smoothness of the overall experience. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a lot of unhappy campers if they fire this thing up and and they they're not able to get a a consistent fast connection with other people and there's lots of de- lag and delay which is certainly possible um, and uh, there there's a lot that goes into the back end of an online multiplayer service as, as we've seen over the years with the amount that that huge companies uh, put into their net code and all of that stuff so uh, I, I'm sort of taking a wait and see attitude I do know that the lifetime membership would pay for itself pretty quick if you think you're going to be using this, you know, ongoing with your buddies. But it's a lot of money to put up front for a service that, you know, nobody's tried yet. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, the ball is in your court, Pie Packer. Uh, a big thank you to subreddit user Asian Cyberman for sharing this story with us. Now, John, I have in my hands here, for the benefit of those listening on the podcast, what looks like a classic Amiga upgrade. This Mm. comes from our friends at RetroRewind.ca, and it's just one example of the many wonderful bits of kit that they sell for Commodore owners, not just Amiga owners, across the range of models. So what this is, this is specifically for the Amiga 2000. It slots in the video slot. We were just talking about pies. A Raspberry Pi sits in the header pins on the top there, and it gives you an HDMI output. You may have seen these as um, the RGB2 HDMI. You can get it for other systems like the Amiga 500, but that involves putting it into the Denise slot. Um, I don't know if there's any soldering involved, but it's a bit more fiddly than just slotting it into a slot, and that's what this does. Mm. And uh, what it also does, as well as giving you HDMI output for a flat panel, you could put a VGA to HDMI dongle on there and just use a regular 31 kilohertz CRT. So... It's effectively an upscaler, and upscalers don't come cheap if indeed you can even find one to go in the video slot in an Amiga 2000. So, lovely bit of kit. Check out RetroRewind.ca to see that and other bits of kit. Thanks for sending it over, by the way, Frank. I'm going to get that into my Amiga 2000. And uh, I I suggest you check them out. Retro Rewind. God, that's not easy to say, is it? Retro Rewind. Get your lips around that. .ca. Uh, Go and check them out, and we'd like to thank them for supporting today's show. 
VR, proclaimed as the future of gaming for so long now, the very promise of it is retro in itself. <laughs> and in this next story, we come full circle, strapping a cutting-edge piece of tech to your head in order to experience one of the 80s finest and most popular computers, the Commodore 64. When you pull the headset on, you find yourself sitting at a desk with a bread bin C64, a disk drive, a joystick, and a CRT monitor fully realized in virtual reality. And of course, that C64 is operational, and uh, you can just play away on it with the virtual CRT and the virtual scan lines on it. It's a lovely looking thing. Now, it's early days for this project. Uh, not all the keys on the C64's keyboard can be pressed, for example, but there are enough keys that can be pressed and enough functionality to be able to launch a game to be able to swap the joystick ports importantly because you have to quite often do that in c64 games and then just to play and enjoy it and it's a really fun experience kind of reminds me of an older project called new retro arcade which which did the same but with a virtual arcade and the mm. machines within it and it works pretty well john have you ever tried retro or emulation via vr before yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, I've been following New Retro Arcade for years, uh, before it was even a VR thing. And I tried it out just last week with my Oculus Quest 2. Uh, unfortunately, it's only available through Steam VR, so I had to tether myself to my computer with the Oculus Link cable. Right. I couldn't freely roam about the arcade, but it's still an incredibly immersive experience. You're walking around what amounts to a dream arcade with uh, arcade machines lined up back to back, a bowling alley, uh, arcade basketball, and consoles all around you with ambient sounds and music. It's a, it's a great project. Yeah, it is. And I can see how that would work well if you switched it over to micros instead of um, arcade machines. Mm -hmm. Although within New Retro Arcade, you've got things like Game Boys, haven't you, that you can pick up. Right. And play you've on got them. Game Boy and like in there. I'm sure that there would be ways that the, the great thing about that project is it's incredibly moddable. So you, you might even be able to drop in some 3D models of, uh, of computers and, and have your, your CPC right next to the Asteroids machine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And air hockey as well as in that. It's so, it's so much. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this, we're not talking about New Retro Arcade. <laughs> we're talking about this virtual C60 and um, what it got me thinking about when I saw it was that I'd love to see this experience scaled up to be a virtual museum in the same way that the new retro arcade gives you a virtual arcade I'd love to see a virtual museum in which you can walk up to the C64 the ZX Spectrum the PC engine whatever you want to use virtually or even better you could maybe pick a machine like the BBC Micro and be transported into a virtual classroom and just have that original setting you know you might have a geography poster behind the computer behind the cub monitor and just yeah. just to really immerse you in there i really like the idea and um you know it will get better and better of course as the vr headsets get better i'm still using a slightly older headset but i'd love to see this kind of thing come to fruition it, it would be pretty cool to have that setting what do you think john yeah, I agree with you. I think that the, the killer app for anything like this is that you can't just build, you know, a computer sitting in a blank room. You've got to fill that space up with lots of things, little Easter eggs that you can check out. You should be able to get up from your chair, walk around the room, look at things on the walls, maybe, you know, look under the desk and you see like some, some old gum or something under the desk. You can pull <laughs> it off there, stuff like that. Um, and, but also having, you know, this fully featured, you know, classic computer emulator in front of you too. Uh, that's what I, that's what I'd like to see. Um, now, it's uh, up until recently, uh, the main pain point with emulating classic computers was the lack of VR keyboard support. But uh, as of just a couple weeks ago, I mean, this just happened, you can actually use a Logitech K830 keyboard. Uh, it has to be that one. That's the only one that's supported so far. And you can have it appear in your virtual workspace. And along with that, uh, the Oculus Quest 2 actually has an experimental hand tracking feature. So you can drop your controllers. And when you put your hands in front of this keyboard, you actually see your VR hands typing on the VR keyboard, which is actually a real keyboard. So that's going to go a long way to increasing the the realism of any sort of computer emulation experience mm, that will work well because you have the actual tactile feedback of a real keyboard right right yeah, so that will work well and it is virtual hands it's not um it's not just sort of superimposing videos of your real hands Exactly, it's exactly. It's, it, it sort of looks like, uh, you know, sometimes when you're playing a VR game, you see your virtual player's hands. It's basically, and it's doing all this very, very quickly. The, the Quest 2 being a self-contained unit continues to astound and amaze me the way they're able to process all that stuff in that little tiny headset. Very cool. 
Or worse still, you look down and you have no hands and you have oh, no body. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that always <laughs> frightens <Frightening>. me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you were talking about the keyboard there. And it's not really the most natural fit trying to use micros in VR because of that keyboard issue. You can do it with this C64 emulator, but it's very much hunt and peck. You know, you mm-hmm. see the 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 curved arrow appear out of your controller and you just sort of hunt and peck the keys. Um, and it does work. And I think for me, something like this works in short doses. I can't really do more than an hour in VR before I need to give my eyes a rest. Me too. I'm the same way. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the tech is getting better and better. So um, hopefully in time, we'll be able to have a much longer virtual stay in a museum um, if such a thing evolves. But for now, just seeing the C64 working as it is, is really nice. There's a great video by the developer of this project. He's very open about his inexperience if you like in creating such a piece of software and he talks in this video about how he figured it all out over the course of a month he really just Mm. shut himself in a room and spent a month trying to work out how to do all of this and um the channel is called open pc reviews links are in the in the show notes and uh, yeah go and check it out because i think there is a future in retro in vr um i really do a great way of preserving uh, the experience because you know, obviously you're not preserving the hardware itself but just the experience of sitting down and seeing it and using it and that will become more and more important as these become um, rarer and rarer yeah. and uh, thank you very much to Starcade 2084 for sharing this story in our subreddit Neil, last week our community question of the week was what video game would you like to supersize? So let's take a trip on over to Reddit and uh, I will read you the top three uh, up, most upvoted responses. First up, Croc Cayman. Get this. This is a great one, Neil. He says, Marble Madness, Ooh. except you control it by running inside a giant hamster ball. Yes. Yes. I love it. Absolutely love it. You could even have a VR headset on while inside a giant hamster ball. Oh, my gosh. I would not be able to contain <laughs> all of the sickness <laughs> inside. I'd want to get out of that hamster ball as soon as I could. Um, Dave Velociraptor writes, Rampage. He says, it's got to be this one. It would look amazing somehow put up inside on the side of buildings, seeing George, Lizzie, and Ralph doing things on a massive scale. Yeah. That, I think, I think that makes the most sense for some sort of an AR application. Exactly. You know, when you... Uh, I would love to see, you know, buildings. You you hold your phone up and you see the monsters actually destroying the buildings that you that you, you see before you. Pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, you'd obviously you'd have to travel to a city to play it properly and find some right. skyscrapers. <laughs> um, but yeah, that would be fun. I'm not so sure about the gigantic naked people because when you get turned back from a monster to a person, they lose all their clothes, mm. don't they? They turn back into a person with no clothes and they kind of <laughs> creep sideways off the screen. Um, that might be a bit we'd, scary. <laughs> we, we'd have to adjust that maybe. <laughs> and finally, Tim Fett 66 says, I'd like to see a supersized Atari Jaguar plus CD converted into a toilet I can install in my bathroom. <laughs> the ultimate Jaguar experience. <laughs> now, Tim, I think you're being a little hard on the old Jag. <laughs> I know Tim is, and I know he's a fan of the Atari Jaguar, so I'm surprised at you, Tim. I'm surprised to hear that from you. (laughs) Now, uh, this week's community question of the week is, what game do you remember playing as a child that you've been unable to track down as an adult. I can't wait to uh, to see what some people come up with because I'm sure lots of people have these long lost games. Uh, so please post your response in the show subreddit. That's r slash this week in retro, and we'll read the top three most upvoted responses on the air next week. I would love it, John, if we can help someone track that game down. If they can describe yes. it, maybe we can uh, make someone's week. Yeah, absolutely. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC and John Shawler. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favorite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you'd like to support the show, please check out the links to our Patreon and Coffee pages in the show notes or in the YouTube description. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.